Well, good morning again, and welcome to the creek. Before we get started, I want to take a moment and welcome our Somerset, Williamsburg, Bell County campus, as well as those who are with us online. Can we give them a warm creek welcome this morning? Now, if you don't know, my name is Will, and I'm one of the pastors here on the creek. Currently, I am serving as the interim campus pastor at our Bell County campus and have been there for about five months now, uh, have been on staff here at the creek for right at a year. We just celebrated a year a week ago, and it is a privilege to be with you all this morning and to get to be here and, and just share with you all what God has laid on my heart. Now, we've been in this series um, all summer long on David. And it's really about the life, uh, the experiences, uh, the journey of David. And it's really about how David's story helps you and I, helps us to write a better story with our lives, because that's really what it's about. A story's being written. And David helps us to see how our lives can become better because of that. Now, listen, you may not know me, and I may not know you, Maybe you know me just a little bit, or maybe you know me a lot. I have no idea, but I probably don't know a whole, whole lot about you, but here's what I can come to the conclusion of, that there are a lot of things about life, about your life and about my life that are the same. Uh, we actually share a lot of commonalities, but one commonality in particular that I want to share with you this morning um, is something we all do. Actually, you did it this morning, and so did I. Uh, you did it on your way here. And guess what? I did as well. Uh, you did it when you got here. Me too. And you're actually doing it right now, believe it or not. And you're going to do it when you leave. And you're going to do it at lunch. You're going to do it when you go home. And Lord willing, and as the country folks say, Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Guess what? You're going to do it tomorrow as well. And you're not going to just do it once. You're actually going to do it thousands of times. Upwards of what research says, 35,000 times a day. And it's this right here. It's decisions. You're going to make decisions and I'm going to make decisions every single day. And, you know, really, for the most part, we do it unconsciously. We do it with giving little thought to it or even giving it a second thought. There are other times that we're faced with decisions in life where you and I, we stew on it and we chew on it and we analyze it. And if you're one of those people, you overanalyze it. You know, you get the spreadsheet or you get the sheet of paper and on one side you have the pros and on the other side you have the cons because what are you doing? You're weighing the options. We all do that. We all kind of weigh the options. Now, I don't have an issue with this next part, but maybe you do. I don't know. Um, but you struggle not with just the idea of making decisions, but it's indecision. You're faced with a decision and it almost paralyzes you as if it kind of stops you dead in your tracks. You think about it, you worry about it, you stress about it, you get sweaty, um, you, you're like kind of freaking out on the inside about it and it's almost as if decisions kind of paralyze you just a little bit. And then listen, there are other times that we say we don't care. This is a thing in my family. Um, we get in the car, occasionally we'll go out to eat. I'll look at the family and I'll say, where do you want to go? And you know what the overwhelming response is? 99.98% of the time, I don't care. And you know what I do? I say, then we're all going to Captain D's. And they go, oh, no, 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 no. See, you do care. And that's the way I do things. I always like to just insert a little something in there to a place I know everybody doesn't like. And when you insert it in there, they're like, hmm, maybe I do care just a little bit. But listen, decisions, they're critical. They're important. And decisions have great power. How do I know this? Well, this right here. Des your decisions, they determine your direction. And your direction, it determines your destination. 
See, you and I are headed somewhere. And the place that we're headed is determined by the decisions that you and I make every single day. See, decisions, they'll vary in power. They will vary in importance and they will vary in magnitude. But there's also something else about decisions. They vary in consequence. Now, not the American term as we think of consequence because the moment we think of consequence, our mind immediately goes to the bad, to the terrible, to the not so good. But listen, consequences can actually be both good and bad depending on what we decide to do depends on the consequence that we receive. And not every decision, not every decision in life is life altering, but there are decisions And these decisions, they're a pathway. And every pathway leads somewhere on the other side. Therefore, there are connections between the choices that you and I make today and where it is we want to be and what we want to experience tomorrow. Now, if you were to do some research, and I did some research this past week, I started to look up uh, types of decision-making, decision-making categories. And if you were to do that, you would get matrix, you would get graphs, you would get charts, and you can find all kinds of information on how it is that we make decisions and what decisions look like. And you can actually plot your decision-making on a graph and they can tell you all these sorts of things about your life of whether it's of great importance, of not so great importance, but listen, That's all like fine and well, but we need to bring it down a little bit, or at least I did, to my own terms, to what I call layman's terms. And so that's what I did. I relabeled it for you. And here are some things. I've come up with three categories of decisions that you and I do every single day. And the first one is this. And the first one is decisions with known consequences that we can look at the decision before us and we can pretty much determine the consequences on the other side of the decision. Usually these end up being bigger decisions coming with great importance. My family and I made one not too long ago, about a year and a half ago, it would be January of 2022. um, I actually came to this building and I sat in Pastor Trevor's office along with Jack and a conversation started. And the conversation started of, would you be interested in potentially coming on staff at the Creek? Well, yeah, there could be a little interest there. Let's have some conversations about it. Well, listen, when I went back to my family and we started having conversations about our potential involvement with the creek, we know the consequences that are on the other side of this. The consequences are, if we say yes, We know what that means for our family. We know that means uprooting 15 years in one city and starting all over and replanting in a whole nother city. It means leaving behind friends. It means leaving behind family. It means ministry and life is gonna look a whole lot different. And well, lo and behold, here I am a year later, right here at the Greek church. And this is where I find myself because after much evaluation and after much talk and much prayer, we believed that this was the best route and the opportunity and pathway God was leading us. But it altered our destination. It altered our journey. It altered our course of life. But then there are other decisions that we make. And these are many of the decisions that we make. And it's these right here. Inconsequential decisions. That means these are of little to no importance. You all have made these today. Guess what? I made these today as well because you made the decision to get dressed and come to church. And in that decision, you decided, am I gonna wear jeans or am I gonna wear shorts? Am I gonna wear a suit? Or am I just going to go with the casual slacks? Or maybe a t-shirt. Or maybe a button down. Uh, You know, we make decisions like Walmart. Or anywhere else other than Walmart. Right? Then there's the decision of Crystal or Taco Bell. And you say, that's not inconsequential. I know. 
That's not at all inconsequential. That's the third category right here. Decisions that are seemingly inconsequential, but you're picking belly bombers or a bean burrito with fire sauce. You pick your poison, you deal with the butt. (laughs) And we make these seemingly inconsequential decisions And in the moment, guess what? They don't feel like a big deal. They don't seem like a big deal. Really, what it has to offer, what it looks like right now, far outweighs anything else. And it actually makes us feel good. And it benefits us. And this happens a lot of time in passing with little to no thought. We say, what's the big deal? What could possibly go wrong? Well, that's where we're going to stick this morning, is decisions that are seemingly seemingly inconsequential, uh, but, and I want to take you back to where we've been. Now, if you haven't tuned in or you haven't been here every single week of the series, here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Go back and listen. Go back and listen. It has been an amazing series with strong challenges and even greater encouragement as we've looked at the life of David. But if you haven't, I'm going to catch you up really, really fast. So here we go. Saul is going to be anointed the first king of Israel. Now, Saul's going to make some terrible decisions, horrible decisions that are going to cause the kingship to be removed from him. And a new king is going to be anointed in his place, but this guy's not going to become king for some years. And his name is David. David is a teenager. He is the youngest of eight brothers. And then many of us know the story of David and Goliath, how David went and faced off against the giant Goliath, the Philistine, and took him down. Saul, uh, being tormented by an evil spirit, uh, was soothed when somebody would play the harp. So guess who they found? None other than David. David would come into Saul's court and he would play the harp. Eventually, he would become Saul's son-in-law and became what Saul believed to be, not David, but what Saul believed to be his greatest threat and his greatest enemy. And then last week, Pastor Trevor took us down the journey of Jonathan and David and their friendship and what that looked like for them and what that looks like for us and how we need friends, true friends in our life who journey life with us. And then also for a long period of time, a significant period of time, David would be on the run as a fugitive. And that brings us all the way to where we are this morning in 1 Samuel 31. And it goes like this. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. And if you're familiar, the Philistines seem to be Israel's greatest enemy. You can go all the way back and see all kinds of wars with the Philistines. And maybe we know the story of Samson and how Samson fought against Israel. The Philistines. But right now it's Israel and the Philistines, and the Philistines are having their way. The Israelites fled before them, and many fell slain on Mount Geboa. So then the Philistines pressed hard after Saul and his sons, and they killed his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malki Shua. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together that same day. Israel's first king is now dead, but there is an anointed king in the waiting. Now just imagine, the king that has been hunting you, the king that has tried to kill you numerous times, the king who has killed people around you just to get to you, you hear is now dead. I know what my response would be. You probably know what your response would be, but mine would be, praise God, thank you, Jesus, the psycho is now dead. I can, there's a, now a clear way. The target is off my back. Ah, oh, but that's not David. Here's how David responds in 2 Samuel. David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and his son, Jonathan, and for the army of the Lord and the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. The Philistines are gaining the momentum. The king is dead. 
The Philistines think that they have the advantage and that they're moving on the up and up. They're actually gaining traction. With the Philistines being at war with Israel, David finds himself in a serious predicament. Why? Because David is living in a Philistine city. He's living in a place called Ziklag and he's sitting there and he's living there. And here's what he comes to the conclusion. By aligning myself with the dead king of Israel, I'm aligning myself with Israel, who's an enemy to the Philistines. And that could be considered treason. So in David's mind, something has to change. And so he says, in the course of time, it goes on to say, in the course of time, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? The Lord said, go up. David asked, where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. So David went up there with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David also took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron. What did David do in the midst when it was time to make a life-altering decision? He did exactly what Pastor John Wellborn taught us back on Father's Day. Seek God first. In everything you do, seek God first. And that's exactly what David did at this moment. And David gets to return to his own land and he gets to return to his own people for the first time in over 10 years. He's back and he's no longer a fugitive. And the men of Judah love it because it goes on to tell us right here, then the men of Judah came to Hebron and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. The people of Judah show up and they begin to recognize David as their leader, as the rightful king. He's a man after God's own heart and he has a shepherd's heart because he cared for the people. He was a valiant warrior in battle and he was an absolutely brilliant leader. But listen, just because this seems to be the main story going on, there's always other stories happening at the same time that play an enormous role in what's going on in, at this time in the nation of Israel. Because there's another man in the story. His name is Abner. And Abner is the captain and commander of Saul's army. He's also a cousin to Saul. And Abner is making his move for power. Because it tells us, meanwhile, Abner, son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and brought him to Maonaim, and he made him king over all Israel. David's the rightful king. David's the anointed king. David's the anointed king by the Lord himself. But here's what Abner knows. Ishbosheth is extremely weak. He's a weak leader. He's a weak man. And he's absolutely going to be a weak king. And Abner wants to use this to his advantage. Whereas David had every right to march up into Israel and march up to all the tribes and say, listen, I'm the anointed king. I'm him. I'm the one who has the crown, not Ishbosheth. It is my turn. I've dealt with this long enough. Enough is enough. Let me take my rightful place as king. But that's not what David does. David continues to remain patient. So what does Abner get? Exactly what he wanted. Ishbosheth, after a few years, became king over Israel. And you can imagine the tension. David, king over Judah, one tribe. Uh, Ishbosheth, king over the rest of all of Israel. And this creates some massive tension between the house of David and the house of Saul, going to a civil war, massive bloodshed over and over and over. And Abner, in the end, would lose everything. Why? Because Ishbosheth would make an accusation against Abner. And Abner, being the shrewd politician that he is, um, he would always join the winning side. So he defects from Ishbosheth and he goes to David and he says, David, you're the rightful king, not Ishbosheth. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have made him king, but I'm here now to make you the rightful king. And I want to help you and propel you and give you the momentum for the kingdom. David doesn't kill him. David doesn't chastise him. He doesn't beat him up. He simply says, great. All right, you can help us. You can join our side. And in David's kindness and compassion and patience, he allows Abner to join his team. 
Well, there's a guy on David's team that doesn't like Abner because he killed his brother, and that's Joab. Joab is the commander of David's army. And Joab can't stand Abner because he killed his brother. And so in revenge, Abner ends up getting killed. And when Ishbosheth hears about this, here's what it says. When Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, heard that Abner had died in Hebron, it says he lost courage. Other translations say he just gave up. And all Israel became alarmed. Why? Because Ishbosheth would be assassinated by two of his own men. And then it says, All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on the military campaigns. And here's what they finally acknowledge. It goes on to say, And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. Israel knew, yet they followed Ishbosheth. They knew it was David who was the rightful king. As a shepherd, David killed a lion and a bear, which helped prepare him to take on and take down the giant Goliath. In Saul's court, court, when he would play the harp, he learned to have a servant's heart. He learned to play and serve the king faithfully. As a fugitive in the wilderness, David learned over and over and over what it meant to trust God more and more and more. And from the time of his anointing of king to the time that it was filled, fulfilled, David would learn patience for the promise to be fulfilled. And here's the culmination of it. It says, when all the elders of Israel had come to the king, had come to King David at Hebron. The king made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. And David, what does he get? He inherits a divided kingdom. And yet, what does he do? He unifies the kingdom, making it a strong, fortified national force. And David is about to experience something he hasn't experienced maybe in his entire life, or at least, at the very least, in an extremely long time. He's experiencing success and prosperity. And if we were to stop David's story right here, it would be easy to stick David on a pedestal. It would be easy to say, My, he, he must have been supernatural. He must have been better than a man's man. He had to be it. He was the one that we should look to. And David in this moment is starting to see his struggles, his obstacles and the trials of being a fugitive. Those are the days past. These are the days of the present and the days of the future. The target's off his back. He's been king in Hebron over Judah for seven and a half years. And now he's gonna be king over Israel and he's gonna reign there for the next 33 years. Now, it wasn't just a year ago that my oldest son got his permit. And when Liam got his permit, we started to teach Liam to drive. But what I didn't do with Liam is I didn't say, Liam, now that you can drive, let's head over to I-75 and let's just, let's go at it. Let's just stick you on there and, and let's just see how you do. No, that's not at all what we did. You know what we did? We came here to the creek, actually, and I began to let him drive corners. Hey, use your blinker here. This is when you'd use your blinker there. You gotta come through, drive around the building, practice pulling into parking spots, practice backing out. I even moved the, the trailer that's out back on the west side here. I would move it so he could learn to parallel park with the trailer. And we would just go all over this area. And then all of a sudden we said, okay, Liam, it's time for you to try the road. And he would get, he'd be a little nervous at first, but then he would start getting the hang of it. And he'd get on the road. And then I said, Liam, your grandparents live in Corbin. You need to learn to drive the interstate, okay? This is an important life skill, all right? In America, you've got to learn to drive the interstates. And I want you to learn to drive them. And I want you to learn how to navigate them. And so I would teach him how to get onto the interstate and get his speed up and to monitor his speed and to make sure he's staying with the flow of traffic and not going uh, 40 in the left lane, okay? I, I, we gotta keep up with everybody else that's going on. And then as he got really good at that, I taught him a specific thing on the car that I didn't want to teach him at first because I wanted him to understand everything else. I taught him cruise control. 
I said, Liam, there's this little button where you can push it and you don't have to worry about your speed because it's going to maintain that speed within a couple miles, an hour of that speed. And he thought, my gosh, this is awesome. And that he uses it all the time. He just drove back from Owensboro yesterday. And my guess is, is he was on cruise control on those parkways where there is absolutely nothing almost the entire time. But let me tell you something. In prosperity and success, you and I have the tendency to go into cruise control. Now, success in and of itself, it's not bad, okay? Success isn't bad, but... But success has this ability and it has this propensity to be a breeding ground to let our guard down, thinking this, no need to pay attention. You know why? It's all under control. We've got a great grasp on life right now. The obstacles, the trials, those were hard. I always had to stay on guard. But now I, I feel like I've got this really good grasp on life and decisions seem to become a little bit easier. And with all that's gone on, David could be thinking, well, well, you know, well, what's the worst that could go on? At least somebody's not trying to kill me. My own father-in-law trying to take me out. And the thought becomes doing what we think is best with what we've just achieved and that I have to take it in my own power to protect it at all cost. And this is where C.S. Lewis interjects. He says the long, dull, monotonous years of middle-aged prosperity or middle-aged adversity, listen to this, are excellent campaigning weather for the devil. That when we let our guard down, there's a storm brewing and there's a storm raging. Now, good decision-making is always important. But in the seasons of prosperity and success where we find ourselves, it is absolutely critical because our decisions today have the potential to undermine where it is and who it is we want to be tomorrow. And let me tell you something, even though we can make a big decision that completely derails our life, typically it's not the big decisions that completely and utterly derail our life. It's small decisions over a period of time that compound and become a slippery slope. And we don't realize we're at the bottom until we look up and we go, mm, something's actually went wrong. Seemingly inconsequential decisions gone wrong can break everything. It can break us, it can break our lives, and it can break those closest to us. And the vulnerability exists when you and I find ourselves coasting through life. And it's in these moments that there's a great enemy. It's a huge enemy. And let me tell you who the enemy is not. It's not other people. Although we tend to like to blame other people when we're at the bottom. Well, it's their fault and it's that person's fault. And it's because of this. And it's because of that that I find myself where I am. Listen, the greatest enemy is not other people. The greatest enemy is not even the great adversary himself, the devil. The greatest enemy is the one you and I forget to put in check. It's the one that you and I oftentimes forget to hold accountable. And the greatest enemy is self. It's you and it's me in these moments when you and I feel like we have a grasp of this life, that we've decided to put it on cruise control and we've decided to let our guard down and just mindlessly go through life. It happened to David and it's exactly what has happened to all of us before or many of us. And guess what? We're prone to it happening all over again. And maybe it's you right now. You're in the middle of it. Now, when it comes to scripture, there are these passages in, in the Bible that are easy to gloss over. A lot of times we just want the basic details. Give me the gist of what it's saying so I have a good picture of what's going on. And let's not worry about the little verses in between. But these little verses, they're a foreshadow of what's to come. They help us and bring us in on what is coming up. 
And at the time for David and in the moment, these decisions didn't seem like that big of a deal. He didn't think really a whole lot about it. He probably wrote it off. For him, it probably seemed like a good thing to do because it would bring security. So David probably just went after it. And yet the weather was primed for a seemingly inconsequential decision to become hugely consequential, giving little thought to the consequences. So I just wanna go back. I wanna highlight a few things for you that were in our passages, or at least in these chapters, to give us a foreshadow of what's about to happen. And it says, so David went up there with his what? Two wives. Some of you all are thinking, I got one. Woo, yeah, that's enough. No, he had two. Ahinoam and Abigail. Listen, TLC is not the first people to run sister wives. David and even people before him in David's own family. And here's what it's going to tell us as his time as reigning king over Judah for those seven and a half years. It says sons were born to David in Hebron. The firstborn, number one, was Amnon. The second, Kiliab. From who? Ahinoam and Abigail, who we just learned about. Then it's going to go on. The third, Absalom, the son of Maacah. Adonijah is the fourth, the son of Haggith. And then the fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abital. And the sixth, Ethereum, the son of David's wife, Egla. I don't know if it dawned on you in those passages, but not one of them had the same mother. Six kids by six different wives. As if being king wasn't enough, let's just keep adding to it. Let's just compound it a little more. Maybe David thought he had it all under control. Maybe this was a good thing. He was building what is known as in that culture, a harem. And a harem was important for people in power because they believed that they were securing their rule, their throne, their kingship. And David probably thought that because what oftentimes people or nations in power at that time would do, the person in the ultimate power over that nation, they would begin to marry people from the territories around. And it wouldn't just be anybody. It would be probably women of power because it would be a king's daughter or a prince's daughter or a military leader's daughter. Why? Because they're never going to go up against the nation that has its own family in it. David thought, well, sounds like a good idea. Might as well. I don't know how he had time to do it. Maybe he's just gifted. I don't know. But look what it goes on to say. He's not done. After he left Hebron, you know what he did? He took more. More concubines, more wives, more sons and daughters were born to him. And like I said, it's a foreshadow of what's to come. These are the names of the children born to him there. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, look, Solomon. He's not even born yet, but boy, they're alluding to it. They're getting you ready for what's about to happen. Ibhar, Elishua, Nephek, Japhia, Elishama, Elahada, and Eliphalet. Here's a bunch of people. David's now building his family because he's pursuing things nationally. And let me tell you something. David made this choice on his own accord because he would know the law. And the law was very, very, very particular and clear on this matter in Deuteronomy 17, 17. A king set over you shall not acquire many wives lest his heart turn away. I don't know what many is, but this is too many. <laughs> I'm gonna just stick with one. That's good. But let me tell you why David did it. He did it for protection because he thought he needed to help God establish the kingdom. He did it for power because more women, more people, more kids meant power at that time. And let's just be honest this morning. He did it for pleasure. 
He got pleasure out of it. All these women want me. I don't know if they wanted him or not, but at least he thought so. And let me tell you something. David was a man after God's own heart, but he was still a man. And he knew the weakness and the vulnerability of the flesh. And I can promise you this. David did not think that this was a seemingly inconsequential decision. He just kind of went with it. He didn't think it would be of massive consequence down the road. Yet, here's what Andy Stanley tells us. He says, your present will become your past that will be present in your future. That means your today, the decisions you make today, tomorrow will be the past. And those decisions have the strong guaranteed possibility to show up in your tomorrow at some point in time. David made some really poor decisions that didn't seem for him poor at the time. But guess what? They showed up in the future. His seemingly inconsequential decision became massively consequential. Why? It would plague his 40 year reign. David believed he was helping to establish his kingdom. He was helping that God secure his kingdom, doing it by means of marriage, concubines, and children. And let me tell you something, his pursuits nationally were detrimental, absolutely detrimental to his responsibilities domestically. And we can find ourselves in the same thing, hitting the grind, going forward, pushing forth, plowing over everybody, doing whatever it takes to reach the top because we're on a pursuit and nobody's gonna stop us. And oftentimes when we do, we are leaving the very people behind whom we walk in the home every single night. And David did. He was going after it nationally while refusing to discipline and take care of his family domestically. And it wouldn't stop. We all know the story of David and Bathsheba. In the spring, when kings go to war, David's at home and he's on the roof and he sees a woman in the bathtub. And you know what you don't do in the bathtub? You don't take a bathtub, you don't take a bath clothed. David likes what he sees, go get her. And that just sets off a whole nother thing. And now it was gonna be a massive thorn in his side. Amnon, his firstborn, would rape his half-sister Tamar David's daughter, the third son, Absalom, would kill Amnon and he would be thrust into exile. Absalom would go back, end up coming back to uh, the fold or to Israel, but he wouldn't have any connection or any contact with David whatsoever. In that time, he would win the hearts of the people, he would betray David, and he would take over the kingship from David. And then eventually, Absalom would be killed. And then the fourth son, Adonijah, guess what he would do on David's deathbed? He would self-proclaim himself the king, the next king. And you know what David? would do nothing. He would do nothing to infuriate his kids lest they become angry at him. He said nothing, he sat idly by and his decision-making was far more impactful than he probably ever imagined. And if you and I would get real honest with ourselves this morning, we are probably far more like David than we care to admit. We've all made seemingly inconsequential decisions that have broken us, plagued us. And you know the mess it brought. And you may be in a mess right now. And you feel broken. And you feel worthless. And you feel unusable and defined to the point that you sense yourself being discarded because what the world deems as broken, when the world deems something broken, useless and worthless and used up of little to no value and little to nothing for, for, for you to offer, you know what it does? It just discards you. It pushes you to the side and it moves on to the next victim. And you may find yourself there right now. And you feel like your life is nothing but a train wreck. And it seems like it's a wreck after a wreck after a wreck after a wreck. Because you had seemingly inconsequential decisions that became hugely consequential 
consequential. They had a big butt at the end of it. But listen, as big as that butt is, there's another big butt in the Bible and it's my favorite of all and it's but God. But God. God doesn't discard that which is messy and broken. He didn't discard David and he doesn't discard us. And that's what I love about this quote by Alistair Begg. It says this, the fact that God works in and through our messiness. He works in and through it. It's not to induce us, listen to this, to tolerate the chaos that we create in our own lives, but to recognize the grace of God in the midst of the chaos. We've all been there and we're prone to find ourselves back there. And some of us are there this morning and we've all felt the repercussions and the consequences, never thinking we would find ourselves where we are. And yet, guess what? This is where we are. We feel defined, we feel beat up, a mess. And here's what we've resolved. It's just who I am. I'll never be any different. People tell me I'm not gonna be any different. They're never giving me hope. They're never giving me any future. I'll never have anything on the other side of this. And I'm always gonna be defined by this seemingly inconsequential decision that wrecked and ruined my life. What seems like forever. And David could have easily been defined. He could have easily been labeled. He could have easily been um, defined by his uh, seemingly inconsequential decisions of taking all these wives and basically ruining his entire family. But this is what Asaph writes about David after his reign. It says this, he chose his servant David and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob of Israel, his inheritance, made him king. And look what it says. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands, he led them. David, he had faults and he messed up and his family was a wreck. And at times, so was David. But Asaph says nothing about his flaws. He says nothing about his decisions and the seemingly inconsequential decisions that plagued the reign of David were covered by the grace of God. And that is good news for you. And that is good news for me because God's promises aren't dependent on our performance. He knows you best and yet he loves you most. Our behavior doesn't disqualify us from his love and our behavior doesn't cause his, him to love us any less. His love doesn't ebb and flow based on how good or how bad we are, based on how messy or how clean our lives look. You know what he did? He said, oh, they can't clean up the mess, but I'm a God of the mess. So I'm gonna go into the mess. I'm gonna redeem the mess and I'm gonna clean up the mess. And you may be sitting there and you feel haunted by irreversible decisions that you've made in your life and you don't feel like you'll ever overcome that. Let me tell you something about God's grace and who God is. No one, no one is broken beyond the Lord's ability to be built back. I don't care who you are, where you are and what you've done, you're still not beyond the Lord's ability to build you back. He's working his plan through imperfect people and less than ideal circumstances. See, when you're in Christ, your decisions no longer define you. Why? Because grace defines you. Yes, there's always gonna be a gap between our heart and our actions. But David's story helps you and I to understand that a better story can be written with our lives. Why? Because God is right there in the middle of all of it. He's in the middle of your sin. He's in the middle of your mess. He's in the middle of your mistakes. He's in the middle of your poor decisions. And while you can't go back on everything, 
I need you to remember this, that you are never outside of such grace that can finish your story well. Your story is not written. It's not finished. And you're never too far away from grace. You're never so far out of reach. You can never find yourself too far from grace because God's persistent goodness is our hope for the unfinished story. Father God, thank you for your grace. Thank you that you came into the mess. Thank you that you walk with us and you never leave us, nor forsake us, nor abandon us. And God, my prayer right now is that somebody's life, all of our lives would intersect with grace, that it would come across and experience your mercy. And that God, as we sing this next song, that it would be a declaration of who you are, but not just who you are, what you've done. Because God, you're more concerned about who we're becoming than what we do. And so I pray this in your son's name, Jesus Christ.